ha, 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 ha. Uh, there we go. All right, everybody. Uh. It's a party. It's Friday. What do they say? It ain't a party unless something gets broke. And we started <laughs> with a whole bunch of broke ass audio. You're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web. I'm your host, Jeremiah Fox. Man, it's, I mean, that's what this show is all about today. We'll get to all of that and more before I introduce my guest, the message of the week, which is something I am borrowing from my guest. And he said he believes that everyone can benefit from athletic approaches when coached properly. The road to recovery is not just a quick fix. It is a lifestyle commitment, and you must embrace the journey through the good and the bad to find your true potential. I think I just found a little bit more <laughs> of my true potential. <laughs> With that, I would like to welcome the doctor, Saqib Habib. How are you today? Good, man. Thank you for having me. I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm sweating a little bit after that. That was... <laughs> that was interesting. I've never experienced that till today, but you know what? It's a learning curve. So, hey. It's, it's, uh, it's happened once before, and the irony of it, it was a show about... Uh, is I had two musicians on. I studied music. I have a master's degree in music. I mentioned that the other day. And, and some old friends of mine from the New York City music scene. One's in LA now. One's in Pittsburgh. And the show started that way. And one of them was an audio engineer, but he wasn't on until the second half of the show. And I was like, bro, where were you when we, when we needed you? <laughs> and it was so funny because for the first like three minutes, that's just what happened. But that's what happens, especially these days. We're all being put under this kind of pressure. Yeah. Nothing operates the way that it used to, right? And that's how you and I kind of like got connected through Dom Jackson. He's a trainer in San Diego. Dom, if you're listening, what's up? Great dude. And uh, I was listening to a show you did with him and you were mentioning similar circumstances where like things are hard. And I think like the quote that I ripped was from, from your, from your bio. Uh, it's just a really great example. It's like, th this is something I've mentioned to you. I was a martial, I'm the martial arts instructor. Uh, yeah. I t teach uh, jujitsu, some kickboxing and Muay Thai and also fitness. And just as important as the physical training is the mental training. And we're constantly talking about that and the lifespan of your i mean it, it's everything like everything has a journey right but like you take martial arts like you get in everything's awesome at first because it's new it's like honeymoon you're super pumped but then there's peaks valleys and plateaus and you just have to embrace it all you just have to get in there and know that like no matter what like whether it's a good day or a bad day as long as you're making your effort you're doing your best you're showing up over time that arc is just gonna it's not gonna be an arc anymore it's just gonna be a line going straight yep. up, straight up. Yeah, I agree. Well, welcome to the show. Awesome way to start. <laughs> I blame you. No, I'm kidding. It, it's exciting, uh, you know. Maybe it's it's exciting. Like, who knows? You know, that happens. Right. If everything went well, it would be boring. Life would just be boring. So why don't you? Uh, why don't you start by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? You have a doctorate in. Yeah. So yeah. I have a doctorate in physical therapy. I am a formal, I, I still personal train. So I've been in personal training slash strength and conditioning for now almost 10 years. Um, I love it. Fitness is my passion. But over the years, as I embraced my own fitness journey and as I embraced the things around me, I led to pursuing my second, probably my newest passion, um, physical therapy. So I just recently mm -hmm. graduated from University of Science and got my doctorate. Um, and I work for Breakthrough Physical Therapy in Medford. And now I'm kind of combining my worlds together with physical therapy and strength and conditioning, my two favorite things in life, and trying to mesh into the overall system. Um, other than that, nothing exciting in my life. I, I've been <laughs> devoted to fitness for a while. I, as you mentioned in your, my bios, I am a Muslim. I practice Islam. I, I live in Jersey, and I'm still learning and growing, man. I can't complain. <laughs> right. We all are. How did you uh, how did you get into fitness? Were you like uh, athletic in high school? You said so. By the way, everybody, he's in Medford, New Jersey, which is like Central Jersey, correct? Yeah, so I'm in Central. So um, athletic wouldn't be the right term I would use. Honestly, I grew up as a little chubby boy growing up. Um, <laughs> you, we so we migrated from Paxton in 1994. My father brought us here. Uh, whole nine yards, American dream, live a better life. And for me, my better life was, hey, I go in the corner, I get for a dollar, I get this giant Big Mac and some fries, I'm good to go. Um, <laughs> so what really got me into fitness was so I was a soccer player. Um, and I think my senior year, I went through a, an injury for my knee, and I could no longer play the sport I love to play. Granted, I wasn't the best soccer player. But uh, my, my athletic trainer, Miss Bauer, if she's listening, she was the one that kind of took care of me and uh, 
she brought me into the gym. She heard, so the athletic studio was here. So they would take care of the athletes and the gym was there. And I was like, hey, can I go try this thing? And I sat on the bench press the first time and I pressed it and the bar came right down. And I was like, what do I do? What am I, what am I doing? I'm stuck here. So since that day and since that injury, the gym has been my go-to. So I was in this constant mindset where, you know, I no longer can play the sport I love. I wasn't able to play soccer. I tore my ACL, tore my meniscus, didn't want to get the yeah. surgery. The recovery was long, and she mentioned it to me. She was phenomenal. She got me back on the field a year later. I still continue to grow and exercise. But the biggest thing was I'm in a senior in high school, and, the, and you get these compliments from it. Wow, your arms look so great. I'm like, oh, yeah, I just did this bicep curl yesterday. So you just kept going and going. And since high school, uh, junior year, senior year, I've been – Pure fitness. I loved it. And I've had my ups and downs, you know, yeah. um, a couple of years later, I did re-tear that ACL and I had surgery with it. <sighs> and at that time I was, a, I was a trainer. So I started training back in 2010. Um, and I used to work for a gym and I went from the front desk shadow trainers, had great mentors, tore my ACL again the second time. I think that was the leeway and turning point of my career. Um, when I tore my leg, my ACL, I tore basically ACL, MCL, meniscus, and a little bit of the PCL. I did the whole thing. I'm like, you know what? Just, <laughs> just, like, like, just, just, just take the whole thing from me, you know? Um, and that was the turning point. That's what I was like, you know what? I, I'm a fitness professional. And do I know what I'm doing? Do I know right. what I'm capable of doing? I just hurt myself. And it was basically, I was coming out of a, a stretch, went to go into the box and boom, done. But it was the mechanics. I understood the mechanics. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started going into more of the corrective exercises after any surgery I put on a lot of weight. I was eating a lot. And then I actually went into competing. I went to bodybuilding and physique competitions. And then I just excelled from there. I realized that I love exercise. I love fitness, but I didn't have enough knowledge of what else I needed to do to prevent injuries. And that's when I went to corrective exercise and working with clients. Um, I used to work with two great clients. They both had challenges for me on a daily basis. One was an amputee. One was born with um, one arm. One was not fully developed. And when I was to work with them, they used to frustrate me. I was like, why can't you do this? I mean, what's going on? Like, what, what am I missing? And it was just education. <laughs> and it just continued. They were great, great. They were very motivated. They taught me so much. I think they taught me more than school because they taught me life skills and adapting yeah. and adapting to the person in front of me, um, which, you know, you, you learn in school, but you, it always does. So then long story short, here I am today with all this, ups and downs with training my own injuries that led me back to physical therapy and after high school i initially wanted to be a physical therapist and i just drew away from the career because i thought i wanted to be a surgeon or something else but here we are today so it, the circle kind of closed itself for me man. yeah it, it often does that especially if you if you just stay on that journey if you don't go right. in the towel like yeah. you said and, and embrace the highs and lows often you find yourself and it's been similar for me especially once i got into uh teaching martial arts you know as mentioned to you the other day my dad has always been super athletic and he's yeah. been a coach and a trainer he's also uh in his mid-60s i think was still a competitive bodybuilder like winning yeah. bench press competitions the dude's not he also has no <laughs> connective tissue in either of his knees because he was a. Uh, he was a triathlete, an Ironman. He was running marathons. He was crazy. Um, and, uh, and yeah, he's got to get two full knees. He hasn't done it yet. But that same thing, he started to put on weight. And he was like, hey, let's, let's utilize this. So his cardio went down. You know, he still does stationary bike and such. But, um, uh, but the same idea with that, right, is like those injuries make you step back. And, again, as long as you don't give up. I've gone through that with jiu-jitsu where I tore my – MCL on my left knee and then a year yeah. later the same week like exactly a year later I tore my meniscus yeah. <laughs> that was my own fault I was doing pistol squats incorrectly same thing you know just it was it was the technique it was the functionality of it um and not understanding it properly enough and then you know you you have those injuries and it's like if you don't give up it forces you to think deeper we talk about this a lot in the dojo too where where people actually take on more information when they're under pressure, not like extreme pressure. Like there's this one saying like, you don't learn war in war because it's too much. It's like too heavy for you to really take on. Um, but uh, Joe Rogan has talked about this a little bit, like the flow state where like, there's just enough pressure where you're engaged. You're not, you're not um, being overly taxed, uh, 
but you're also not bored and distracted. And that's like, the, you know, like when you're bored and distracted, like you're not taking on anything. When, and that's kind of like when things are easy, you know, and but when there's just that right amount of pressure where you can still function, that is, I think, where we take on the most information where we like we need it. And a lot of us are going through it now, especially like the business community. You know, you've experienced it yourself where junk were closed down. You know, I've, I've gone through my share of shit with uh, with my own businesses. Um, and it made us all think, like, what's most important? How can we continue this uh, this process and not, you know, not lose everything? Um, I really find that fascinating how those are the, those are the circumstances where you feel. And it's funny because the mental part of that is you feel like that's a low, right? You're like, oh, I'm injured. My performance is down. But you, you're probably taking on more information and learning and growing more than you did when everything was good, like especially right before the point you hurt yourself. <laughs> and I think that's where it comes down to is like they always say you learn from you learn the most from failure. Yeah. And for me, when I look at that, I was demonstrating that box shop and I <laughs> successfully failed, but I learned the most about my life at that point of knowing where right. to go. So hey. So you you were you were demonstrating when you got hurt? So I, yeah. I, I still remember the client. Once in a while me and him still reach and we laugh about it. He looked at me <laughs> You look really pale. I was like, yeah, because my knee's kind of hanging, man. I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> uh, so then I remember they got me a, an orange juice. Two of my coworkers rolled me out on a chair in the backseat of my car. We drove off, and that was it. But I, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's that failure of, like, knowing, wow, I really successfully failed at that. Like, I, I yeah. did it. <laughs> He's never going to do box jumps in his life now because I just bust <laughs> uh, That's my fault. But you know what? You live and you learn. It's cool about Yeah. That. Um, so did, did, did that client ever get box jumps down after that? <laughs> I think the highest we went was about 12 inches after he goes, nope, you tried that one last Good time. enough, man. Good enough. You know what? I'll take that. That's a good step for us. Right there. Right exactly. There. It's I better hope. than being flat on the ground. <laughs> I was like, we'll get there. So and I, I, did, I do think I traumatized that poor young man uh, for a while. But, you know, I still touch base. I'm like, you know, they're not that bad. You just have to do it right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's really awesome. Cool. Well, we're going to hop into, we're going to jump into a little break. Yeah. Um, and like, let's hope when I come back, my audio is good. <laughs> All, right. All right, we'll be back in every in a few. Everybody, you're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web. Okay, everybody, we're back. It sounds like you can hear me. I can hear me. We're good. We're good. <laughs> you can hear me. Great. The Entrepreneurial Web. I'm your host, Jeremiah Fox. My guest, Dr. Saqib Habib. He's in Medford, New Jersey. He's a personal trainer and physical therapist, PhD in physical therapy. In fact. Uh, you were talking about, I'm curious about this, about tearing your your ACL the first time and not getting surgery. What was that recovery like? Because my, my jujitsu professor, same thing happened. He tore his ACL and he didn't get surgery. And the dude is like a cat and a monkey combined. He can just fold. It doesn't seem to have limited or prohibited his mobility in any way. So I think that's where one of the biggest things lies is even in physical therapy now, we see whether to get surgery or not surgery at the mm -hmm. initial time when I was injured, it was a partial tear, it was a complete tear. Um, we knew that. And then basically the, the, the rehabilitation of it, honestly, it was god awful. It was painful. Yeah. Um, I, it was constant pain, a lot of range of motion stuff. And I'm pretty sure with my athletic trainer at the time, Ms. Bauer, we did a lot of range of motion stuff. We did a lot of strengthening and then basically excelling it from there. But you understand body and you understand your mechanics really well. So I went basically another three and a half years without with the torn meniscus and ACL, no surgery, um, and just knowing my limitations, mm -hmm. I transitioned myself as once I was discharged from athletic training, went back into soccer, started playing. I knew where I couldn't pivot as best. I couldn't do certain things to the full extent. So I was always guarded for sure. Um, and then as I increased my knowledge with exercise, as I learned more, it was basically going back to foundation fundamental movements. Um, when I injured myself, I was a young athlete, didn't have a lot of background in exercise. Our coaches knew one thing, pound you to the ground. And I was playing yeah. as hard as I possibly could. And, you know, coaches are coaches and all, but they're not strength coaches. They don't know enough about strength and conditioning, which is why I went the realm of strength and conditioning. And I understand movement. I understood that and I need to work in rotation. I need to work in the sagittal plane. I need to work in a frontal plane. I need to work in every plane of motion because when I got hurt, I was in a rotational injury. I was rotating and boom, that was it, right? So my body kind of transitioned to that. So I learned 
went back to the basics. And I think that's the beauty of rehab is you go back to fundamental movement. You go back to the basic logistics stuff. Even in jiu-jitsu, right? Before you guys really go out there, grab someone, throw them over your shoulder and toss them, you spend a good four or five weeks really understanding foundational steps. And if you skip that foundational step, you're either going to get killed out there or <laughs> you're going to basically injure yourself. And that was the same thing with any type of realm. So in physical therapy, we build foundational steps first prior to getting to optimizing movement pattern. I think when I went back to that route and as I continued, I always had the sport in mind. I always knew I wanted to play soccer. I still play soccer. I knew that I wanted to be able to return and kick the way I want to kick and do those things. So it worked out well, but the knowledge that I gained of working in different planes was the biggest success tool for me. Yeah. Um, and I think that it's, it's, it's even now with people that ask us if they need get surgery or not get surgery, when I, when I work with a client or a patient, I tell them, you know, these are the things that we want to realm into. These are the things that we, we slowly develop. We work on mobility. We work on stability before I really load in strength. Um, and people, right. have done, I know plenty of great athletes and I know plenty of great people that have never had surgery and they need surgery. And they just continue to go avoid it because mm -hmm. knee surgery recovery is brutal. It's a lot of work. It's right. great effort, but it took me... When I actually did have the surgery, it took me almost seven months to go back to running. And without the surgery, I, you know, less than six months, I was back out there. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and you work with athletes still? Like, do you, do you work with, like, professional athletes or, like, amateur? Well, right now, it's more of, like, the high school athletes that we see in the clinic. Um, I have no professional athletes, unfortunately. I was in Florida last year as a uh, – my last year of school, actually, I was with Exos. So I had the opportunity to work with professional athletes, which is amazing. Um, I learned a lot from those guys. I worked with high school athletes. So currently in the clinic, we do see some athletes, mostly high school, um, not a lot of uh, some college, depending on the level of expertise. And then I have some of my friends that play college ball, I'll help them out here and there because yeah. you know, they're always banged up. So I'm like, hey, I'll take care of you. So. <laughs> right. Uh, and it helps me learn. You know, I like working with them to learn because if someone does pop in the clinic with that injury, I'm like, oh, I did this with him. So let me try it. So, yeah. And it's interesting, like working with like the high performers versus just your average person, mainly at the martial arts school that I've been training and teaching at for the last four, almost five years. Um, it was it was more like neighborhood people, not yeah. it, there was no competition. We weren't doing sport jujitsu It was self-defense. And then a lot of the other things you were talking about, like range of motion was huge. I'd say the average age of a student there was probably like mid 40s. You know, so these aren't like young people who are out there crushing it. And, you know, a lot of a lot of people were, you know, had day jobs. Maybe they were kind of sedentary. And this was their way to really, you know, change that and, and change the, the course of their life. Um, and and so range of motion and mobility were paramount. And it was, you know, one of the things my instructor always says is your ability to move will dictate the outcome whoever controls like the movement whether it, you know it's a it's a physical confrontation or just you against yourself you know like imagine you i mean i'm sure you've seen it plenty of times where once somebody becomes immobile a whole host of things <laughs> can, can start to go wrong i mean that's the thing with old people right like they get injured or or lose mobility and once they're stuck then then you know breathing becomes issues uh it's just like a domino effect on down the line uh, so I, I think the mobility aspect and the fundamentals that you were talking about, I mean, Jigoro Kendo, the founder of judo, always says, you know, masters love the basics. And so, you know, at our school, you would do more like a, like 12 weeks minimum of basics before you ever got in a situation where you were putting it to use in a in any kind of like a flow situation where it was like, OK, slap hands and go. Like, yeah. That didn't happen for a while. <laughs> And then even after it did, like the basics, the fundamentals were part of every class. It was just like something you cannot neglect. Yeah. You keep coming back to, you keep hammering it. I mean, and it's funny, I, I recently renewed my, I, I always enjoyed the basics, but like lately I've just been so, it, it's been like a renewed relationship uh, with them as things were shut down. And we couldn't do a lot of the fancy cool stuff, you know, because we were working, you know, you felt a lot of times I was alone going through those basic drills. Um, and, and when you're not training as like, we were training every day a lot, you know, so then you're loose and limber all the time. You're just like in that, that, you know, you just feel like you're in a washing machine and you can roll around. As soon as that got restricted, it wasn't like 
atrophy, but it was just like, you know, you're not, you're not moving as much. Those basics were the thing that really contributed to like staying on the chorus. Uh, so a little renewed love for those for sure. Uh, after dealing with that. I agree. I think that's what it comes down to is remembering yourself and reminding yourself the basics still have to exist. Um, and we always tell our patients after discharge, you know, if you do these four things, like a lot of my patients, I discharge I'm like, Hey, do these things for the rest of your life. You should be injury free. You know, you should, God forbid anything happens. So even for me, like, I still till today have stuck with everything I've learned in physical therapy for my own knee um, from what my athletic trainer yeah. taught me till today. And I still do it just because you know what? I know, I know it's been repaired, but I don't want to go through it again. So I stick with those foundational components in every time and just continue to build. Um, and so since your, since your surgery, it's been okay. You haven't, you haven't. I, I well, it's been great, man. I can't, I've got a brand new knee in here. <laughs> no titanium, but you know, new ligaments, things have been great. Um, and that's, that's, I think that was the biggest strong factor going back to school and learning and developing those things. But I've been smart about training. I've been smart about how I've been utilizing mm -hmm. eating. Everything came into a factor. I've looked at, I didn't just look at the exercise at that point after I surgery. I looked at everything. I looked at nutrients, what I was putting in my body, how I was eating, what was going on. All those things do play a factor. That we don't realize, you know, yeah. what you do eat and what causes inflammation, what helps with inflammation, all those things components. So, I looked at the big picture overall wellness approach, not necessarily just the fitness side of it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And that applies very much to what's happening today in people's lives. Like look at, you know, businesses and careers. I'd have to say like for, for my places, we were, we were forced into a situation where we had to just think about like, what was the most important aspects yeah. of our business? Like really like taking it back to the fundamental level, like what are we here to do? How do we execute that now that we've had a limb chopped off or like whatever, you know, and you told me too, you've said a number of times when I've spoken to you, you're like, I've got, you know, like dealing with clients. How is that? How does that look for you? I mean, you said uh, they open gyms so, somewhat. Gym, and gyms somewhat open in New Jersey, you know, so we have been, you're allowed to as personal trainers train one-on-one -on -one and so forth. Um, and then even so for our facility, we have one-on-one -on -one coaching that's allowed trainers are coming into play and some clients are very eager to come back. Some clients are like, nope, I'll stay away. Right. Until back to normal. And that's the thing. And even in gym, so a few gyms over the bridge opened up. I would say, I was like, I got to go work out at gym. I just got to see the field, the social field, yeah. but you're very like on edge. You're still like kind of paranoid, like what's happening. Am I supposed to touch you? Am I supposed to hug you? Like I've seen some friends at the gym, like, Hey, let's just go with an elbow. I haven't seen you in a couple of months. Like, you know, so it is different. Um, Clients, we, my biggest thing with some of the clients that I personally train and so forth is just keeping communication and just sometimes it's the social things that trainers forget that they're doing for clients, just keeping talking to them. Even my patients I haven't seen in months, I reach out to like, hey, how you doing? They're like, I'm not coming. I'm like, no, I don't care about that. I just want to see how you're doing. Logistically, like, tell me how you feel, what's happening. Can we help you? Can we do that? I think that was the biggest thing in this pandemic people forgot to do. We were yeah. so worried about when are things going to open? Can I see my friends again? Can I do that? But the difference was, were you communicating anywhere? Were you mm -hmm. really reaching out to them? Were you checking for support? It's not always a number of getting a man and getting a session out of them. Like, hey, be a, be a human being. Like, hey, you're stuck in those four corners like I am. Like, how do you feel? Like, I hate it sometimes, you know? Um, I think that was the biggest thing. But I'm eager and excited things to get back out in the norm again. Um, but I do think norm has changed. But it, it developed and it's a continued develop of like, you know, growth and overall growth mentally, spiritually, the whole nine yards. I think you've learned a lot. And I think for me in the last month or so, putting an emphasis on mental health, you know, like mental awareness. I was used to getting up at six o'clock, go for a run and go right to work. And now it's like, get up at six o'clock, go for a run, go right back into bed. Um, Cause you can't go to work, you know? So that <laughs> things do change. So it's like, how do you establish the new norm and then go back to the norm when things come back into play? So. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, it's, it's going to be a long time before it gets back to anything, I think, close to what oh, yeah. I we think, were experiencing, whether, whether it's, I think it's going to be a combination of, of the risk, but also fear. And you were just yeah. mentioning that with there's a lot of people, the same here, like in, you know, in New York now, in, in the city, at least in the rest of the state, they've opened everything else up to a large degree where like, you can go to gyms, you can eat inside yeah. at restaurants. But New York City, not yet. They keep uh, pushing the goalposts back and delaying things. But, you know, you've got half the people, once they allowed outdoor seating, were like, boom, we're going. And the other half are like, you are all going to kill us all. <laughs> you know? So it's like these two opposing forces. It's crazy. I agree. I think it's funny because I, uh, I was with a friend today and he was like, he took his kids to the pool. 
I'm like, oh, how'd that go? He goes, well, we wore a mask. We sit in a corner. I'm like, okay, so we were in a pool. What happened? He goes, people <laughs> want us to stay away. I'm like, then why'd you go to the pool? I'm I like, know, right? Oh, just don't do it. Like, it's just not worth it, you know? Um, wow. It's the biggest crazy. thing. Like, the norm isn't there yet. I think norm has changed. I think people are lurking to appreciate everything that they have now. I think that's one of the things we missed out. And I think that's what yeah. initially we forgot about is the appreciation of those small things and yeah. continue to appreciate those small things, you know? Cool. We're going to take another break, man. We'll be back in just a few minutes, everybody. You're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web. Okay, everybody, we're back again. It's the Entrepreneurial Web. It's Friday. We got everything under control. <laughs> I'm your host, Jeremiah Fox, here with my guest, Dr. Saqib Habib out of Medford, New Jersey. So we were talking in the last segment about the mental training being like super important. Like it's always important to be fit. But uh, the mental training is is often said in the martial arts school I train at 75% of the battle is mental. Absolutely. The other half is 25 because you can easily talk yourself off the bridge. Right? You can easily. It's just what's going on up here. The body is kind of resilient. There's breathing exercises and all kinds of stuff you can do to continue physically but mentally is where we often tend to throw in the towel and the way the thing that really attracted to me to you and and the idea of having you on the show was when you were on dom's podcast and you were talking about training during ramadan which i'd also heard uh fira sahabi who is uh one of george saint pierre's main trainers talk about on joe rogan's podcast because he is uh, he's in montreal but he and he's got a huge crazy gym and the dude just trains like i think he lives there i don't think he ever leaves it's just i think he's in there <laughs> tri-star gym and i think he just like sleeps in the corner and wakes up and just trains like all the time but he was talking about you know joe was asking him like do you train during ramadan and he was just like oh yeah he was like it sucks but you do it you know, and, and I'm not sure everybody knows the strain of that. Now, my my two chefs at my restaurant, my chef and my sous chef are both from West Africa and they're they're Muslim and they they practice Ramadan every year. And I'm, I've watched it five years straight now, you know, and just the struggle that these guys go through and hearing them say like they're waking up at four o'clock in the morning and cooking a huge meal and then they, they go back to sleep. But then often you have to get up for work yeah. and then all day long, daylight hours, no water no food no nothing and these guys are working in the kitchen making food for people and i'm like this is just some kind of torture man this is yeah. awful but the especially my my head chef he was he was kind of like a soccer star in the gambia when when he was young and and he's always maintained we we trained this morning actually outside before uh before the show um He's, he's always trying to maintain some sort of fitness. And every year he says, oh, I'm going to train through Ramadan this year. I'm going to train. I want to, I want to slim down. And every year he's like, no, nope, I can't do it. So you've done it. What, you know, the, talk about the, the mental preparation and that, and that battle, because that seems to me like, obviously there's physical strain there, but like, you really have to have that mental fortitude to, to pull that off. I think the mental part of this, so people don't understand why we fast. I think that's the right. Point. Most of people is basically most of them are fasting to live the life of the prophet. Um, fasting is one of the pillars of Islam, so you have to kind of go about it and learn its supplementation. Um, basically, you fast to remind yourself what we just talked about the small things in life you don't appreciate enough. And for us, food and water is something we've always taken advantage of, and I think we still currently take advantage of it. Um, but your overall time for that month is you increase worship, you reflect on the bad, you, you improve on the, the good, you continue to make sacrifice and look at self-control and deeper going in spiritually, getting connected to God and kind of cleansing your soul essentially. That's one of the biggest things mentally I was preparing for. So this year was a little different for me. This year, COVID hit before Ramadan. Right. Um, and I was like, all right. So I was with a few friends and we're playing things with diet. We're messing around trying it. So I went into the realm of intermittent fasting prior to Ramadan for the first time in my life. So intermittent fasting, and that's something I told Dom, a lot of people didn't know about it, it was 16 to 8. I was doing 16 hours of fasting, 8 hours of the eating window. Um, basically, when Ramadan came into the role, it was the same thing. It was just reversed. So yeah. my eating window, I'd be sleeping, and my fasting when I was wide awake, I'm like, oh, this sucks, right? <laughs> Completely worse. But <laughs> my, body, my body was used to fasting, essentially. Um, mentally, I was like, I know I can do it. Physically, I'm like, well, this is going to be a lot harder, but I wanted to make sure I stuck with the plan. I have a small gym in my basement. I continue to exercise. I met up with friends in their gyms and continue to exercise. And mentally, I was like, okay, I know where I'm at. 
um, and I changed the system up a little bit. So normally I would wait until after um, we can open. So after it started to work out. And at this point it was like 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. I was like, it's too late. I'm not doing it. Um, I did a lot of research. I went in, I looked at fasting while training and I've seen great results. I've seen a lot of people post good research articles on it, good evidence supporting that, you know what? You can train while you're fasted and you don't have to hurt yourself. Um, it does benefit you. It does play a role, but you have to take care of everything else prior to hydration levels, food, nutrients, all those things do have to come into play. Um, and typically that was my first thing was research. I looked at research. I looked at constant research. I wanted to preserve my lean tissue mass as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and the first thing I changed completely was cardio. Last couple of times I did a lot of cardiovascular exercise because it's easy to do. You can easily go run on an empty stomach, right? Yeah, but yeah. Not to knock my marathon runners or anything like that. Um, I just think for me, running was something I'm not good at. I could go do it. So I cut that down significantly. Um, and I try to utilize my main metabolic tool source to be fat burning, right? That was my thing is kind of maximizing my metabolism to start burning more fat, essentially. And then what the research did show is you can adequately train three or four times a week with resistance training, and you should see a good change in your body. You shouldn't really be deteriorating your body. And that was a step one. So reducing my exercise tolerance and reducing what I normally would do. So instead of working out seven days a week, I was down about four or five days a week. I also am cut down cardio significantly. And then I learned how to exercise in a fasted stage. I think going from intermittent fasting to Ramadan is a good success tool on my part because you, you do learn how to, your body's adapting, your body's adjusting. And then from there, supplementation. I, I use proper supplements. Um, research showed that, you know, five, it was, I think it was five grams of um, BCAs, 2.5 grams of leucine in your system prior to the fasting stage. So in the morning, I would lock in my BCAs and I would lock in my leucine supplement. I would get in my protein. I use the delayed protein. Mm -hmm. So it's like a casein basically. So instead of fast absorbance, it delayed over eight hours to expand. And I would make sure I got basically three scoops of that sucker in. Um, and by the time it was all supposed to wear out, I was right at that time to start my exercise. And then timing. Um, with my cardiovascular exercise, I actually did it immediately after I would eat mm -hmm. in the morning. And then I would exercise with weight training about a half hour to an hour before I would wait, go sit down for my meal to open up my stuff. Right. Uh, that was the bigger thing for me to understand properly of nutrition timing. I know a lot of people say, you know, it's, it is what it is, whatever it may be. But for me, I found the most success there um, because when you're weight training fasted, you can increase that that catabolic hormone, right? You can increase cortisol. So you can increase that stress on your body if you're not properly timing it. So as yeah. I increased that stress in my body, I was like, well, in a half hour, I'm going to eat everything in sight. So it's perfectly fine. And now <laughs> uh, I set myself up for that. But mentally, I think the first week was really rough. It was hard. You're, you're, you're malnourished, malnourished as much as you want to say you're not. You're, you're starving. Yeah. Don't have as much water. So I try to drink a liter at night, a liter in the morning if I could. But we would be up at three o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I'm going back to bed. I don't want to eat. But you, you force yourself to eat. Yeah. And then by the end of it, so I would say the first week was rough. You got adjusted. Week two, three, I killed it. I was like, this is great. Got it. Got it going. Week four, you're like, man, this has been a month. Like, wow, I'm starving. So my last month, uh, my last week was a deload week. So I set my program design to make my first first three weeks really excessive and hard. And my last week is a deload. Give my body a rest. Give my body a break. It was only four, five days, not the end of the world. You can take a week off of training and be fine. Um, and it worked out well. And I actually lost a little body fat. I kept my strength fairly strong and I worked with it. But I used my resources as well. So I was with my local nutrient company at Aries Nutrition with Pat. Me and him sat down a day and Pat gave me an idea of advice with supplements. I sat with research and looked at what evidence about acid training. I reached out to friends that have PhDs in strength and conditioning. They're looking at the center. I looked at a lot of strength coaches. And I think that was not, the biggest lesson I learned this year was utilizing my community of the experts in my community and not just trying to do it myself. I'm like, hey, what do you guys think? I don't want to do the research. What do you think? And that's what happened. So we finally found a system for me that worked. And I will say now it's year 12 of perfecting the system. And I still don't think it's perfect because I, I, you know, there's parts of it where I'm like, you know, that day I didn't really do as much. So I have my numbers down and just keep working with it. Um, but it's been a blast, man. I learned a lot. And 
the the beauty of it was I didn't feel like I stepped back into my fitness goals. I didn't feel like I stepped back into my overall thing, but I think I stood, I took an emphasis of the the I'll use the method from Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins talked about, you know, you spend 10% of your time on the problem, 90% of the time on your solution. So that, that's what I did this time. I spent 95% yeah. of my effort on creating a solution for knowing that Ramadan isn't a problem. It's just a thing we got to do. Figure out how am I not going to starve myself to death and just still do what I like to do and how I like to enjoy it. Because for me, exercise isn't just for the looks. It's the stress relief. It's That's what I find to do. You know, that's my oh, yeah. best part of it. Like, dude, after a long day of work or a stressful day, I want to go knock out some iron, go run, whatever. So, Man, like, you should try, try jujitsu. <laughs> I, I was exploring it, man. It might happen in the near future, so. It's, it's such, like, I got into it. You know, I, I was doing gymnastics. I was running. I was swimming. And, yeah. and literally, these guys opened their, their school, like, five doors down from my restaurant. And we had just opened that too. So life was crazy. I was running like four or five businesses and they were like, you should come in and train. And I'm like, I'm a little busy right now. Like you'll, <laughs> you'll make time. And I'm like, these guys are nuts. And yeah. I went in and did a class and I was like, Oh, I'll make time for this. Yeah, and it absolutely. was cause it was such a stress relief, especially once you get to the point where you're live training yeah. and it, what it really is. And you were just talking about this is dynamic problem solving. It's like <laughs> the problems are going to be there. Like with everything that happened with my restaurant, especially during this time period and the other places too, but like, especially the restaurant, like I've gone through so many things like that. And it's funny that you said that about the intermittent fasting leading up to like as training, I feel like restaurants are always going through this shit. <laughs> so it was like, Oh, here we go again. It's just another time period where I'm not going to make any money and everything is crazy and like stuff's on fire. And like, of course, you know, um and and we just kind of a lot of us just adjusted because we're we're kind of we're in that we're in the trenches constantly um and and the other thing your your point about community also like i know a lot of the places where i'm at we we have you know it's very tight knit communities here they're they're small but they're packed there's a lot of people on top of each other literally and the only way a lot of these places were su survived was because we didn't have the time to research but we had the community so those of us who were like more resilient and, and, and the, you know, the bonds that are coming out of this are, are really fascinating. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the, the, the other end of this storm to yeah. see, you know, the way people are, are feeling. All right. We're going to take one more quick break. We'll be back in just a minute. We'll wrap it up with one last segment. Everybody listen to the entrepreneurial web. Okay, everybody. We're back. Last segment of the entrepreneurial web. Get your weekend popping right. I'm here with Dr. Saqib Habib out of Medford, New Jersey, talking about physical, but most importantly, mental training, whether it's for your physique, for your health, for your business, for your life, and just your mind. Uh, you mentioned intermittent fasting. Have you listened to any of, uh, do you listen to Joe Rogan's podcast at all? As, not as much as I used to. Um, lately, I've you're, been, you're familiar with it? I'm familiar with it, but yeah. So I, I didn't listen to podcasts at all prior to like just over a year ago. And for yeah. some reason, a buddy of mine sent me uh, an episode that had a jujitsu guy on it. And it was somebody that I'm, I'm kind of fascinated with. So I listened to it and I'm like, okay, cool. And he was also one of George St. Pierre's trainers. And then like right after that, it was a great show too. I was like, wow, this is, I've been missing this. And it was like three and a half hours. I was like, there's no way I'm going to listen to this man. I listened to the whole thing. I listened to the whole entire thing. It was so good. And then right after that, he had George St. Pierre on and he was talking about he had like this when he when he fought Michael Bisping and won when he did his comeback and like won his his his, you know, second title up a weight class after like a four year, you know, retirement. He had this crazy stomach thing. He was like throwing up all the time. And it's funny because intermittent fasting was the thing. And he was in a training camp to fight a world champion. He yeah. intermittent fasting is what he used to kind of get his digestion and stuff back on track to where he could, he could continue where he could compete. And he actually won. And like the dude that I guess the day of the fight, he was like throwing up, you know, he couldn't hold anything down. It's like terrible conditions to go into, but he was talking about the same thing, like not losing, not losing, uh, you know, muscle mass, um, you know, everything, everything really like worked out for him that way. And then just after that is when Fira Sahabi came on and he was talking about the same thing. And you also mentioned the like not overtraining, like yeah. finding that sweet spot. You yep. know, Sahabi was basically saying 90% of your workouts should be mellow. 
Yeah. You should only be like gassing out and like totally just like going hard, like less than 10% of the time. If you want to do this regularly and daily and sustainably, you want to do this for a long time. Like it should be more mellow. You should be under like the 80% threshold almost all the time. And then just kicking it up to fatigue, like total fatigue, like once a week, maybe because your body needs that recuperation time. Um, and it's just interesting how like all that, again, it's just like that pressure training you were talking about, like doing your research and being prepared and intermittent fasting before, before really fasting. <laughs> that worked out really well, man. I'm telling you. That's, that was, that's that really awesome. Good. That's something I have to share with my chef because they're always like, they're the opposite. They're like Ramadan's coming and they're just like engorging themselves, you know, they're drinking like two liters of soda. They're just like trying to get it in yeah, before, no. before the hammer comes down. And I think that's where even during Ramadan, so like, uh, again, depending on the person and what we do, we do binge a lot, right? We go into binge yeah. eating, like binge eating in the morning. I didn't really binge this time around. Anymore. I just ate. I was like, you know what? I can't stuff myself anymore. And I was really good with it. Um, my family is really good about making the proper meals. We really had fruit every time. We had everything nutrient wise and just being smart. I think overall it's being smart about training in general. Um, I know Ramadan is a big factor in our life. It comes here every year. And I, I went through a competition. My first competition in the middle of my prep, a 16-week prep, my coach was like, coach, I got to fast, bro. And he goes, oh. And he's like, well, I was like, what do I do? And he looked at me, he goes, we'll find a way. And he and he was very, and, you know, we did it. And even this year, I was in transition for a powerlifting meet. And I looked at coach again, and I was like, coach, guess what? I was like, I got to fast again. He goes, great. Figure it out. And I was like, all right, yeah. So that's the beauty of it is we adapt. And I think that's the biggest yeah. thing, even in the in this pandemic time, of the lessons we've learned. And it's kind of weird on our realm for Muslims. Like we go pandemic, we go Ramadan, we go back to pandemic. It's like we're constantly adapting. I think people are constantly adapting. And right now, for everyone in every state, we're adapting. We're adapting to a new norm. We're adapting to everything around us. What can we control? Fix it. If you can't control it, just kind of let it go. Like, you know what? Just worry about what you can control and focus on that and just make the constant small little improvements that you can make. And as we continue to make those small improvements, like for me, this whole working out for Ramadan wasn't just in a one month thing. It took me years of trial and error, mm. years of work and years of gun. I went back and got a doctorate to learn more about the industry I've been involved with. And even then I'm like, I still gotta learn more about nutrients and nutrition and so forth. So it's like constantly going, I think precision nutrition just recently came out with intermittent fast. I'm a precision nutrition coach and they just came out with something for intermittent fasting and eating. And I was like, wow, I still gotta learn some more. So it's constantly growing and improving and adapting to what's currently present with us. And even like you talk about small business in the restaurant industry, you guys are adapting. You're changing on a weekly, monthly, yearly base. Um, and I think that's the biggest kick ticket to success in any industry. Adaptation. Right. You really adapt yeah. to what's going on. Uh, yeah, I feel like it goes back to those like jujitsu mobility uh, training ideologies where like as long as you can move, yeah, there's still an opportunity. Like when it gets bad is when you can't move. Like yeah. if you're pinned to the ground and you can't move, that's 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 when the trouble really starts to come. If you have even one option and you you take it, then it, it resets everything. Like it could change it could change for you in a heartbeat. And I, that's the thing I, I keep telling myself now is like every day I get up and I'm like, this is gonna be hard. <laughs> This yeah. like today could be our last, you know, you just never know. But um, if I'm always looking for that one little thing, and of course it comes with like years and years of failure, like you said earlier in the show, like I've, you know, I've lost businesses. I've had businesses close. I've sold, I've had to sell businesses, you know, or just shut them down because of mistakes that were made. So now for me, it, it was, I don't want to say it's good timing, but uh, things just were in a certain alignment uh, where there was, there was, less failure <laughs> to be found this time. I don't want to say success yet because we're not out of the woods yet. You know, nobody knows uh, quite what's going to happen, but um, it pleases me to get up every day and still be able to to go in and continue to fight. And I've got people to think about like those guys, a lot of them would have no, they'd have nothing else. You know, they, the unemployment isn't available for them. So many options just aren't available. So it's like, I have to do it for, for other people, which also helped, you know, like when you're with your as a physical therapist, you know, you're constantly doing this for other people. Like you've already, you're in good shape. You, you've kind of weathered a lot of things, but then you get to do it for other people. And, yeah. uh, yeah, 
and it's funny you mentioned that like for the other people so i was having a discussion with a, a partner in our company the other day and someone texted me about the energy you bring to the client and i was like when are you coming back i'm like i won't be i'm not full-time yet so i'm not full-time for a while um and i was like he goes well you bring good positive energy to the clinic so i want you back and i was like this is what it's about for us in the industry, in your coaching, you're an owner of restaurants. I think for us, it's the people that you can impact and the, the positive you can give to them. I think it's one of the biggest things therapists, coaches, and anyone in general in business forgets at times is the client and what you can provide for the client. We get so stuck on the big picture for ourselves and our success and you know, putting food on the table because a lot of us aren't working. We, I don't have a norm. I don't have that consistent paycheck coming in at times, but overall, the people coming to see us, you know, they provide for you, but like the impact you create on them and for your coworkers and your workers in general, I think that's the biggest thing that this pandemic has now shown. And we go back into the start of like appreciation of the little things. I think a lot of people didn't realize like, Hey, you know what, when I work with him, I actually enjoyed him. So it's one of those things that you kind of forget because you're such in a routine. And then the routine was destroyed and disrupted instantly by a virus. And now you're like, well, I should have taken a lot more time and done this and done that and appreciate those things and reminding yourself of exactly like I think for me, leaving personal training to go into physical therapy was one of the decisions I made a long time ago. And I never, never really knew if it was the right decision for myself. But when I get those texts and get those vibes from clients and patients, I'm like, you know what? I made the right choice. because I've learned a lot. I grew as a, I grew a lot in school, matured fairly quickly in education. I think now I have the means of taking care of anyone that steps in front of my eyes. And that's part of the reason why I have that quote I have. Like, I have an athletic background. I was a strength and conditioning coach. So I don't really look at my patients like patients. I'm the, I'm the physical therapist that comes up to my client patients like, hey, do you want to puke today? Because I think you're going to puke. And they look at me like, I'm a physical therapist. I'm like, yeah, you have to exercise. Though. And that's the type of question I ask. And my aides always look at me and laugh. I'm like, why are you asking? I'm like, you guys, we're going to have some fun. And, like, most of my clients and most of my patients are trained like how I would train my athletes because I'm like, you know what? Why not? Like, you have the capability. I went back to school, spent thousands of dollars to learn how to treat you properly. And now I just implement all my knowledge and apply everything I know to make sure I don't hurt you. And also, I don't want you to puke, but you might do it. You might not. And I had one thing. I was like, sorry, I'll call your insurance company. Um, and that's I've it. been there. I've been there. I know that. I know that scenario. I had five well, years ago. That's the <laughs> So we're going to have to wrap it up before we go. Let uh, everybody know where they can uh, contact you if they'd like. So I, I, have, I, you can reach me on Instagram at Dr. Sakiba B. You can reach me at Facebook, Coach Sakiba B. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram. Um, I do work out of Medford, New Jersey at Breakthrough Physical Therapy. So come out, reach us out. And then aside from that, you look up my name, you should see my website pop up too. So my website's there and links are all provided and so forth. Um, and 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 the Instagram account is, is fire. It's great because you put up lots of tutorials. Like they're short, they're concise, but I've gotten so many things. Those, those one leg, uh, Romanian deadlifts with the kettlebell. <laughs> I saw that on your, on your, on your, uh, one of your posts. And I've been trying that. Those things are fire. I love them. They're, they're great. I love yeah. that. Probably one of my favorites is hundred percent. Yeah. It's, it's throwing funny. on me. I got to get better at it. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to have to wrap it up. I'd love to catch up with you, though, in a couple months and just see kind of like the state of things, especially, you know, uh, since we're in the same region and how things are opening up and, and how people are responding. And just to check in. Absolutely. Man. Thank you for having us. Right, man. Hey, man. Thank you for being on. Everybody stay safe. Keep that mental fortitude high and sharp. Have a great weekend. We'll check in with you next week. You're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web. Peace out.